Hey, and welcome back to You Read John at 120. I'm Jeff Clint, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student of computer science at the University of Virginia. And today we're going to be talking about Aristotle, the great philosopher of lived from about 384 to 322 BC, uh, and kind of a all over famous guy. Uh, and kind of before I start, uh, to be fair, some of this stuff is getting a little blurry in my mind. Uh, although I did, in fact, take a whole class on Aristotle in 2003. That's what, 12 years ago now? And I'm starting to forget most of it. Because not everything that he came up with, or come up with, was in and of itself useful, and I didn't use it. Uh, and so it's kind of beginning to, uh, uh, even though I've read practically everything he's ever written, um, I, I don't remember all that much about him. Uh, so I had to do some review for this video, and hopefully I'll get the valuable parts across, but uh, it is worth pointing him out as a person worth uh, uh, studying, because as Bertrand Russell put it, quote, almost every, sing or every serious intellectual advance has had to begin with an attack on some Aristotelian doctrine. Uh, and, unquote. Uh, and uh, although uh, Aristotle has made a lot of errors and his you know, very uh, numerous works uh, have a lot of ina inaccuracies in them, quote, uh, his blaring errors uh, kind of, quote, make it difficult to do historical justice to Aristotle until one remembers how large of an advance he made upon all his predecessors, unquote. So, in other words, yes, he got a lot wrong, and it's even so wrong as to be uh, extremely hard to get into your mind how wrong he is and to describe it to, to any detail uh, to some extent and in some areas. Uh, but nevertheless, he's still valuable to know about because of the huge advance that he made in our understanding of the natural world and kind of culminating the, the entirety of Greek culture of his time and kind of getting to the point where we could get further from him. Um, and so, realistically, he either founded or rigorously uh, studied in a way that nobody else did before him uh, in fields as diverse as optics, category theory, epistemology, logic, physics, anatomy, astronomy, embryology, zoology, geology, meteorology, biology, especially marine biology, zoology, metaphysics, ethics, aesthetics, theater, music, rhetoric, linguistics, politics, earth sciences, psychology, government, theology, and poetry, and hence, poetic science, and hence, computer science. See the Ada Lovelace video for details on that. Uh, but, so, this guy has done so much in so many different areas, and it wasn't like he just did, like, a little bit in each area, like, say, uh, Robert Hooke did. Uh, he actually, you know, made breakthroughs in, in biology, and in logic, and in science, uh, all over the place, and he wrote a know, many, many things down, uh, and we remember him for it. Um, and his writings are pretty close to a, an encyclopedia in and of themselves, as far as what Greek knowledge was at his time, uh, and of our records of it. Uh, so, some of which was meant for publication, and is kind of written for people to read, and some of which was kind of notes or teaching aids, never really meant to be published, but we still read it as if it were anyway especially on biology, but the, he, he wrote a, a great deal, and he wrote a great deal on a great number of topics, and if you go into the history of, you know, practically any of those topics, you can find kind of at the very beginning, there's Aristotle kind of creating uh, order in that field and making it a serious thing to study. Like Plato, uh, he intentionally made his writing difficult to read. Uh, in his case, it was kind of intentionally made to be boring. Uh, he was kind of an elitist. Uh, he thought that you know the only people who should be ruling society and the only people who should be gaining the benefit of his work uh, were kind of smart people, uh, you know, the, the smart Greeks perhaps, uh, weak-minded people, and you know people idiots uh, would have trouble understanding his ideas. Uh, and he wasn't really interested in teaching them and teaching the masses of the underclass that lived in his Greek society at the time. And unlike Plato, he didn't hide what he was going to say. Uh, behind allegory and metaphor, or allegory and me metaphor, uh, he was just very verbose and dry at it. So if you go and try to read his books, 
uh, in retrospect, uh, it's hard. It's, it's hard to get through, and you'll fall asleep probably at least once if you try to read the whole thing. Uh, it's, it's a very dry read, um, and it's hard to remember stuff in it because it's, there's nothing to kind of keep you attached to it. Uh, and modern writers have advanced the art of writing itself beyond where he started at, uh, even providing that he wrote in Greek and translating Greek to English is not all that great sometimes, but uh, even so, you know, a lot of our ability to translate to some extent comes from this, uh, and so on. Uh, when the Roman Empire fell, or the Greek, uh, Alexander the Great, uh, his kind of military campaigns ended. Uh, over time, uh, his writings were kind of lost a little bit. Uh, they, there was kind of one guy in Rome who had them, and they weren't really shared or read or learned at all, uh, or taught. Uh, you know, some of it was, some of it stayed in the school, uh, but over the centuries they were slowly lost, or sometimes quickly lost. Uh, and it's important to note that because there was one place in the world that they weren't, and that took him seriously as a uh, kind of philosopher and thinker, uh, which is of course the Islamic world. Uh, and they kept him and his writings alive for centuries after Europe completely lost interest in them. Uh, he's known as, quote, the first teacher, unquote, in the Islamic world uh, for this purpose. You know, Europe destroy, you know, had destroyed most of his writings and became kind of a, you know, backwater, inbred continent for well over a century, while the Muslim world was kind of a bright center of trade, science, and commerce, in part because they took his ideas seriously. So Aristotle founded a school, uh, the Lyceum. Uh, I, I don't think it's still around, but uh, there are certainly schools that to this day call themselves the Lyceum. Uh, kind of in uh, heritage to that. Um, his means of teaching was also kind of unique uh, in that he would actually walk around and take his whole class with him as he taught. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to really do this with this laptop that I'm recording with, otherwise I would totally have stood up at this point and started walking around, but it's just a little bulky. Um, so our view of what logic is realistically dates to him to a large extent. Uh, and it wasn't really until about the early 20th or late 19th century that we started to really go beyond uh, his ideas of how syllogisms work and what you can prove and what you can know uh, in that sense. Uh, his, his list of logical fallacies, uh, which many of these videos in this series are based on, that's his list. It's his idea to kind of note them down and treat them as fallacies. Uh, Plato, before him, knew of the problems with reasoning, and so did the sophists and many other kind of intelligent people before him, but Aristotle wrote them down and laid them out simply enough for maybe not everybody to learn, but certainly the learned people of the world uh, who had access to his writing. And because in his day, the act, the act of writing was still new, Plato before him complained as if, you know, it was kind of like a newfangled technology that people were losing their ability to, to be involved with oral history because of this technology of writing things down was making it too easy for people to, you know, not have to remember everything, you know, that you could think of and know. You know, in, even by Aristotle's day, uh, the act of writing was still new enough that there was a very few cases of people before him, at least in Europe, systematically going through and burning all extant pieces of some author's work or all copies of certain writings. And so Aristotle had a pretty good historical coverage of that time, of anyone dating back to the very beginning of written records, at least, again, in Europe, uh, of anyone who had said anything and written it down on any topic that was kind of interesting. And so, at, at least for Greek uh, knowledge, he could go back you know, a couple generations and say, okay, well, this guy thought this on this topic, and this guy thought this on this topic and he had the records. It wasn't destroyed yet. There wasn't enough knowledge of the people who would be interested in destroying books and, and writing uh, and scrolls or whatever that it was worth doing so yet. That kind of developed later uh, and possibly within, you know, late in his life uh, at the kind of earliest. His student, Alexander the Great, conquered an empire extending from Greece on one side all the way to India. Uh, and so the writings of the learned people from much of the populated and civilized world 
was within the grasp of the kind of Greek Empire at the time. Uh, there were some exceptions. China was kind of outside of the bounds. They developed kind of independently. Uh, and there were kind of a little bits and pieces of the world that had developed writing by that point that they didn't kind of have access to. But again, Greece was one of the earlier countries to get there. Uh, and so he had oh, pretty much everything that that part of the world had access to. Uh, and so he was able to kind of skip over some of the early experiment work. Because up until that point, up until the point where writing could be used to transmit knowledge, uh, kind of every culture had to experiment on its own and learn things on its own. And yes, there was a, you know, thousands of years of hunter-gatherers and uh, kind of uh, e even kind of basic ag agriculture going on uh, where you know, people were experimenting and learning things. Uh, but you, you had to invent a lot of different things. Uh, and so that learning from each other was an extremely slow process because you had to explain things without having access to a written you know, reference that you could say, okay, well, just go read this and learn it. You couldn't. You'd actually have to talk to someone who knew how to do something in order to learn it. Uh, and so this process of learning was really slow. There were no YouTube videos which you could watch a person who originated an idea tell you about it. You'd actually have to talk to someone who understood it. And so Aristotle collected that everything that was written on particular topics, uh, uh, at least up until his day, read it, arranged it in order of how close to the truth he felt it to be. And then from the earliest and presumably most incorrect writings to the closest and most kind of formed a consistent worldview uh, that, that kind of encompassed as much of it as he could and as much of it as he could kind of put together in his own mind and then describe the process of, okay, well, you know, here's what we started thinking and here's the progress we made up until we got to this point and now this is what I think. And he did this on many, many, many topics. Uh, and so you can actually trace back, if you can get to his writings, kind of what humans thought all the way to the you know, founding of writing. Uh, and in some cases before the founding of writing, because some of, a lot of the original writing was basically just putting down on paper what oral history had been saying for quite some time by that point. And this is kind of ironic in a sense, because uh, he kind of treated this as, you know, the old people, uh, the, the, the people before me were kind of wrong, and then the closer you get to me, the closer we get to be right. The Christian world, when they got to Aristotle, kind of treated him as an authority uh, and as being right on everything. So instead of kind of looking at themselves as part of the same process of improving the knowledge and improving the details and kind of testing and getting, you know, confirming what we know, they treated it kind of the opposite way, where it's like, okay, well, Aristotle got it right, and we're, we're not going to challenge him anymore. And for quite some time after the, the Europe rediscovered Aristotle from the Muslims, uh, then it was kind of left as, as good as you could get on a lot of different topics. And sure, there are a lot of areas where he's to this day still correct, uh, but there was a lot of areas where he wasn't, and so the progress past him was kind of slowed because of the Christian world kind of treating it that way. Uh, he was one of the early people to kind of use the, the metaphor of energy uh, relating to kind of food such that, quote, uh, you know, eating something is like throwing logs on a fire uh, and kind of doing things in terms of, you know, you have to add energy to, you know, a human being to get them to move. Uh, eating is kind of putting that energy into them. Um, it's related to the slippery slope fallacy video. Uh, there's a quote uh, from pol or his politics, book uh, five, quote, uh, jealousy maintains the spirit of obedience to the law, more especially in small matters, for transgression creeps in unperceived, and at last ruins the state, just as constant recurrence of small expenses in time eats up a fortune. The expense does not take place all at once, and therefore it is not observed. The mind is deceived, as in the fallacy which says that if each part is little, then the whole is little. In the first place, then, men should guard against the beginning of change." Unquote. So it's kind of a view of what can go wrong, such that you you won't see it when it's actually going wrong. It's kind of hidden from view because of the smallness of the details involved. Um, so, so he had a lot of different ideas on a lot of different topics. But one of his ideas uh, is that you would look at what a species is. Uh, so if you're kind of a biologist in the field and you're looking at ants, you don't look at the ant that has a broken leg or that isn't walking quite right. 
in order to determine what an ant is. In order to determine what an ant is, you try to find the best ant that you could find. The ant that kind of most exemplifies the, the possibilities for anthood. Uh, so an ant that is successfully carrying its food, or the ant that is successfully laying eggs, or the ant that is successfully part of a hive that is thriving. This is his kind of view of how to observe things, especially complicated things. Uh, and he did not limit that to the natural world. That would also have applied to human beings. So we could take someone like, for example, Ada Lovelace, uh, and view her as the ideal human that all other humans can aspire to. And not necessarily just that, but that is what humanity is. Humanity is people like that, and then people who are kind of failing to be like that. I'm uh, going back to that at uh, uh, a Lovelace video. Uh, he's also the kind of originator, or at least one of the earlier proponents, of the idea that there are four kinds of elements. This kind of earth, fire, water, wind uh, idea. Uh, that when people kind of treat the idea of there being you know, everything being uh, created and uh, existing in those four elements, th this is how old that idea is. And when we think about what kind of chemistry, what kind of physics that he was aware of, that was what was informing the view of these four elements being the entirety of everything. Of course, now we know a little bit more about how nuclear physics works, and we can be a little bit more clear about what it is and is not an element. Uh, so, you know, we don't have an excuse to believe in just four elements anymore. Uh, and people who do still somehow, you know, put it on their t-shirts and whatnot, uh, without knowing that it was just the best current guess of how things work in, by Aristotle, uh, are kind of uh, misled in terms of how uh, uh, sure we are that those four elements are what they are. Uh, he was also the first to, uh, among other topics, uh, document uh, logic enough to kind of clarify what deductive reasoning is. Uh, see the video on deduction. Uh, and so he would kind of describe in detail how deduction works and how uh, you can get to a certain conclusion if you have true premises and a valid argument in a deductive uh, form of reasoning. Uh, that was kind of his, he was the one who clarified that. Um, he would have viewed things uh, that change as not really as important. Uh, he didn't see the value in derivatives because he didn't have a concept of derivative yet. Uh, but what's important is the essential being of those things. So it's, again, the, the part of humanity that doesn't change, the ideal of humanity, the, the, the object, the mathematical object that doesn't change, the thing that describes what we are uh, in, a, in an essential way. That was what he was going for, to try to get those right to try to at least you know, write down or, or come up with a list of those sorts of things. Uh, and you know, he, he did try to, to tackle a lot of big problems with that perspective and with the things that he was able to come up with, including, but not limited to, Zeno's paradoxes, uh, which he came up with a not very interesting answer, but at least an answer to them, uh, even if it wasn't all that helpful. Uh, it was related to the uh, alchemy video, because Newton, as an alchemist, would have had access to Aristotle. Not all of it, but some of it. Uh, it's related to the Descartes video, uh, because Descartes would have learned uh, a lot about Aristotle, not all of his works, but uh, it was who he would have run into as far as defining the science of his time. Um, and so there was kind of that. Uh, in Aristotle's day, it wasn't as clear of a kind of split between philosophy and science. Uh, it was still kind of one area of, of thought. Uh, so philosophers like Aristotle uh, investigated all kinds of topics, as you can kind of imagine with a, you know, a list of topics earlier in this video. Again, looking for the universal truth behind them, the things that you could kind of be certain of behind the topic in question. So if there was rhetoric, you would look for the things that don't change in, you know, from person to person as they use rhetoric successfully. And Aristotle performed original research in many of those areas, again, looking for the essentials, looking for the, the things that you could know that are permanent. But even so, even though he, he was involved with experiment, there was a lot of things that was missing in his time uh, that we kind of take for granted. Uh, concepts like mass, velocity, 
force and temperature even uh, were all developed later. Uh, and so he didn't have access to clocks, thermometers, or force gauges uh, in to, to experiment with. He, those things had to be invented in, by someone else even uh, in order for thinkers of the world to kind of make use of them to have theories that described how things work. And so he had to kind of build his theories of understanding without all of these things. And as kind of mentioned, not everything that he came up with was right. He thought that the Earth was the center of the universe, for example. That turned out to not be the correct answer. But he had arguments for things even like that. And so it was the arguments that were mistaken, which was kind of the important thing. Uh, and that finding the correct argument was the, the task of the next thousand or so years of scientists. So he introduced, among other things, the idea that uh, nature is composed of things that change and that studying the changes can provide useful knowledge and underlying constants, uh, even if the magnitude of the change was kind of off the table. So he, he was already starting in the direction of understanding changing things in dynamics. It wasn't quite developed to the point where calculus could be thinkable yet, but he was starting in that direction, especially by the end of his life. And he had lived long enough to see some kinds of change that other people who weren't kind of as interested in the written record uh, would have really noticed. Uh, lakes dried out, volcanoes exploded, the Nile uh, Delta grew, uh, and Greek uh, society was sedentary enough that we could start to record these things. And even in between revolutions and wars and you know social drama that kind of makes ours pale in comparison sometimes, you know, he was able to see that, hey, you know, there are things changing in the long term. Uh, and those things might be studyable. So you could study it, something like geology. You know, the, the idea of studying rock formations, uh, again, was something sort of new. I mean, people looked at rocks, I'm sure, before him, uh, but he kind of understood them in a new way. He also tried to argue for a natural cause of dreams, uh, rather than interpreting dreams as messages sent by the gods to describe the future. Um, and he had a couple arguments to try to make that argument. Um, he was also, you know, viewed, going back to the video on pragmatism, uh, he viewed ethics as a practical matter, not something worth doing for its own sake, but uh, in general was kind of, took a practical view of a lot of different things that today we might not take that view. Uh, he would have viewed uh, something he called eudaimonia, if I'm pronouncing it right, eudaimonia, uh, as kind of this ultimate aim of all human deliberate action which roughly translate to the right kind of happiness um, and kind of ordered his worldview around, you know, maximizing that. Uh, he would have treated the kind of idea of a virtue or something that we should be doing uh, as kind of a middle ground between extremes. So for example, for courage, courage itself is a good thing, but if you have too much of it, it's considered rashness or kind of acting irresponsibly. Whereas if you have too little of it, you're basically acting as a coward, you know, cowardice. Uh, so the, the right thing to do in that case is to have just the right amount of courage, not to have too much or too little. And pretty much anything good or, or worth doing, uh, in his mind, would have kind of extremes that you have to keep in between. Uh, so see the fallacy of moderation as far as how that could be uh, kind of interpreted as misleading. But he certainly viewed a lot of things like that. Uh, would have, uh, kind of relating to the uh, Polya video, uh, quote, the aim of Aristotle's logical treatises, uh, known collectively as the Organon, uh, was to develop a universal method of reasoning by means of which it would be possible to learn everything there is to know about reality, unquote. So this is actually, you know, his Organon w was an attempt at doing very much what, what Polya was trying to do as well, to kind of make a universal method of, of reasoning and learning and you know, arguing so that you could get to the truth if you started with the, the right kind of data. Uh, and it's interesting to kind of note that he's trying to do that. Uh, he was apparently the first to treat cities uh, in his mind as kind of organic things rather than uh, machines, uh, i.e. so that every part of the city has to be working uh, together in order for the whole city to survive or for any part of the city to survive without it. Um, 
and so he was kind of unique in that. Uh, he was, as many people of his time, both sexist and racist, uh, but unlike a lot of others of his time, uh, he put women's happiness and their uh, eudaimonia uh, on the same importance and on the same level as men's. Uh, so in his view, there was at least that level of equality going on, which is also kind of notable. Uh, he had uh, kind of a set of categories that he kind of put everything into, uh, which were substance, quantity, quality, relation, place, time, situation, condition, action, and passion. Kind of an interesting who, what, when, where, why, only about ten of them. Um, and he was also the first, kind of going to the uh, video about uh, argument from contradiction, uh, he was the first to really kind of put a, make a stand on the law of non-contradiction and to argue that in order for you to be able to know anything, or for in order for you to be able to convince anyone of anything, you have to believe in the law of non-contradiction. I mean that you cannot believe both something and that something, or that something is true and false at the same time. Uh, and that, yes, there are language games that you can play, uh, but at least there are claims that you can make that have a true or falseness associated to them that you can have both at once. Same thing for the law of excluded middle, which we haven't really covered all that much at all. Uh, he's also the first to originate the syntax of analogies. So if A is to B, and C is to D, uh, that is kind of a way of expressing analogies. on my head, but uh, that was kind of his syntax for it, and that is persistent with time. Uh, and he, again, was interested in universal truth. So he would have viewed uh, God as this kind of first mover, uh, the, the thing that sustains all substances, the thing that causes uh, atoms and, or whatever makes up the physical world to make up the physical world, the, the kind of beginning of life, the, the, the perfect uh, you know, top of things that are good uh, engaged in, in what he saw as, quote, never-ending contemplation, unquote. So in other words, the philosophers were the ones closest to God because they did all the thinking, and of course God is a thinking thing, etc. Uh, but regardless of whether or not he had the right idea there, it's it important to note that that was his idea. And if we start looking at the old monotheistic kind of religions uh, up until his point, uh, they really kind of treat their God as one of many, uh, as just their chosen one, or the one that kind of leads their particular tribe uh, in a, the right way. Not necessarily in this kind of all-seeing, all-knowing, all-perfect way uh, that he would have described. And so uh, the kind of New Testament, which came after him by quite some time, uh, you can kind of read that and look to see how they treat their God versus how the Old Testament treats their, you know, its God. And see, after reading him, did they take any change, or did they change it because of him? Uh, there's an argument to be made that there, there was a change there, and that they, they tried to make it more logically consistent to believe in a God, again, because he made it possible by describing a God that was at least more logically consistent than what kind of came before him. The idea of religion kind of took it, was, was modified by this, this guy and his approach to it. Uh, so, um, regardless of what you believe on that topic, uh, even in, some, in something as kind of going as far back as religious belief, he made an impact on how people think about it, and how people think about the, the gods, uh, and damn near got himself killed over it, uh, just like many of the thinkers before him. But, again, everyone from science to religion, from arts to sciences, uh, were all in his debt. Um, he made progress in our field, no matter what our field is, uh, and it is worth knowing about him for it. Uh, again, I, I can't teach an entire course on him in a half an hour, uh, but this is at least a, a kind of a, a footprint in, in the direction of uh, kind of making mention of all the things that we did. So if you have any questions about Aristotle, I'll try to field it. Uh, as usual, there should be a Bitcoin donation address at the bottom here somewhere that you can support this video series. and. Uh, uh, I guess thank you, Aristotle, for 
making computer science possible. We'll see you next week.